It's good to see all of you tonight, and thankfully we're getting to weather this storm together and spend some time worshiping together. You know, obviously praying for those that are much more affected down in Louisiana, Mississippi. Uh, I'd invite you to take out your Bibles and turn to Romans 12. Romans 12, and I'll read those first two verses that Hayden read for us. Uh, the past two Sundays, due to sickness and, of course, not wanting to be here, even with a runny nose, me and Jason have both had to cover Sunday night when we didn't plan to. <laughs> so I'm going to pretend like I didn't find out I was preaching like just like a day ago. But what I've got for you tonight, since I didn't really get a chance to think about it, I'd just like to present to you what I've been thinking about the past couple of weeks in preparing for the sermon that I preached Sunday morning. And if you remember, the sermon I preached last week, Sunday morning, was about convincing. And I made the point about, you know, this is how we convince somebody. We show someone the gospel, and we have to allow the gospel to do the convincing. The, the more I was considering that concept of convincing, I, I started trying to think about, well, who is the hardest person to convince somebody of a spiritual position? Where you hold a spiritual position on a certain scripture, on a certain pr Christian practice, who is the hardest person to convince of that? And I thought about everybody in the world and everybody in the building and all that kind of things. And I come to this conclusion, and you can disagree with me if you like. You can think of somebody harder. That's fine. But what I had come to be thinking about this past week, some of the hardest people to convince about a spiritual position are your own brethren. Sometimes those are the hardest people to convince on something usually brethren who grew up in the church. And this is what I mean by that. And, and I'm speaking from firsthand experience because I did grow up with Christian parents going to church every day, where I grew up going to church, being taught the doctrine, being taught what's right, what's wrong. These are the passages we use to explain what's right and what's wrong. And then as I grow up and I go forward, it's almost like I've become very stubborn and dogmatic maybe in the positions that I have been taught. And now I hold fast to those positions, not necessarily because I have passages for them, not necessarily because I came to those convictions on my own, but because that's what I was taught. And so I stick and I stand there. Now, some of those things are right as long as they're actually scriptural. Some of those things are a problem if they're not actually scriptural, they're just traditions I've been taught. Y'all can see where I'm kind of going there with that. Now, people that did not grow up in the church, they're actually very good at changing their position or understanding of a passage when they've been presented with new scriptural information. Because if you were converted when you were 25 or 35 or 45, 55, whatever it may be, there was a big moment where you had to say, no, not my understanding, but God's understanding. And you had to flip a switch manually and change your understanding because you have been faced with new evidence, scriptural evidence. And now you're probably very good at changing your position on a certain topic because you've done it before and you've done it in a big way. Now me, how many times have I had to change my position on a big topic? You know, not, not really often. Because I've always believed in baptism for remission of sins. I've always believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I've always believed in the resurrection. I've always believed that there's life after death. I've never had to change my understanding on those things. It becomes harder for me to change my understanding on other things when I have better, a better understanding of the scriptures. And hopefully for the next half of my sermon here, all I'm going to be trying to do is explain that concept. And then the second half of the sermon, I just want to talk about growth and where growth really comes from and what growth really looks like. Before we read Romans 12, let me remind you of something in Hebrews 6. You don't have to turn there. You remember in Hebrews 6, the Hebrews writer calls a certain list of practices as elementary principles in Christ. He puts baptism in there. He says baptism is an elementary principle in Christ. He says the resurrection is an elementary principle in Christ. What he's saying there is everybody that has half a brain should be able to understand these things. <laughs> that if you've been converted... And if you've been only a Christian for a week or an hour, you should be able to understand these few elementary principles. And those are things like there is a resurrection, that Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
Baptism is for remission of sins in Jesus' name. Those are the things that the Hebrews writer calls elementary principles. But we all have to admit that there are things in the Bible that are not elementary principles. There are some things in here that are difficult and they're hard to wrap my mind around and I have to work on them and study on them and think on them to be able to come to a better understanding of those things. A couple of weeks ago on a Sunday night, I preached a sermon about Hebrews 10, 26 and what my position was on that verse. I have not always held that position on that verse. I have studied and worked hard and thought hard, and then I had come to a position on what that verse meant, and that's when I presented it. Jason preached a sermon several weeks ago on Romans 8 and what the new creation there meant. What did he have to do? He had to study about it, and he had to look at the context, and he had to read about it, and then he came to a position, and that's when he presented that position. So what I'm talking about here is not those elementary principles. I'm talking about today, about when we have to make little changes through our walk with the Lord, where we start holding new or different positions than we held yesterday because we have a better scriptural understanding today. Does that all make sense? And the problem is here is I cannot give you examples because I know whatever example I'm going to give, someone's going to run with it and they're going to stop listening to my sermon. I'm talking about those hard things today. I'm talking about your understanding on a particular elder qualification. I'm talking about your understanding of a particular hard passage. I'm talking about your understanding of a particularly hard Christian practice. And what I'm suggesting that we have to do today is we have to always be growing and willing to make changes about our understanding to better fit our unchangeable God. And that's what I'm presenting. Romans 12 teaches this. Look at verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. That the goal here is not to be conformed to the world that makes changes about you to make it look more like it, but you want to be transformed and make changes about yourself so you look more like God. And not only that, but we continue to renew our mind through the scriptures that I may be able to prove what is God's good and acceptable will for me in this earth. Is that something that happens overnight? You know, did you get baptized and you had verse two all figured out? You came out of the water. I know what the perfect will of God is now. You know, if somebody came out of the water and did that, what would we do? We'd put them back down because evidently they don't understand. (laughs) That's something that takes a lifetime to understand the perfect will of God. And it's one of the reasons why we get together and we do preaching and we do teaching. It's one of the reasons why we get together throughout the week and we study God's word. What are we all trying to do? We're all trying to today better understand the will of God than we did yesterday. And that demands growth. That demands transformation. That demands a heart that's willing to change when they learn something from an unchangeable God. So as we move forward, let me look at Ephesians 4 and demonstrate that in another passage. Ephesians 4 shows you a good way of making changes, and it shows you a bad way of making changes as we grow as Christians. Ephesians 4.11, that he hears Jesus, and he himself gave some to the apostles some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about from every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by which every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of the self in love. That last verse there, especially about the growth of the whole church, but verse 13 He's talking about till we come to the unity of the faith. 
faith, right? Till we come to the full measure of the knowledge of the Son of God, till we can call ourselves the perfect man. Have any of us gotten there yet? No, the concept here is that we will continue to learn from the apostles and to learn from teachers of the apostles. And we will continue to grow to look more and more like the perfect man who is Jesus Christ. We don't have all the knowledge right now. You're not going to have all the knowledge in this earth. But we can press on to make that our goal, right? To quote Philippians 3. As well, that thought's carried in verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things into him which is the head Christ. That we're supposed to grow and have a better understanding like Christ does, that we would look more like Christ and have knowledge more like Christ has. Now, the very opposite of this is verse 14, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, for the cunning and craftiness of the deceitful plot, by the trickery of men. That right there is somebody who's not growing to look more like Christ. That's somebody right there that's constantly making changes about themselves and their beliefs, not because it's something that they read in God's books, but because that's just something they want to do this week. And we all have maybe either been in situations ourselves or know people that believe something different every two months where they're all caught up in this thing and they're going to believe this. And the next month you go talk to them and they all believe this something now. And then they believe this. Well, what is that? That's like a wave just being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Sometimes I think we become so scared of verse 14 or we become so scared of being accused of being verse 14 that we forget to do verse 15, which is make changes. Change my understanding of something. When I've been presented with new scriptural information, new to me, that I would be willing to make a change on a position or a change of an understanding because I understand something better. And there would be changes that would happen. Now, would it be tossed to and fro changes? No. It would be changes that would be headed in one direction. And that one direction with the end result would be the perfect man, Jesus Christ, right? Now, going back to my thing I said at the very beginning, why would someone like me have such a hard time with this? Someone who was taught from a very early age what was right. How many changes have I had to make in my life? You know, I think almost when I was a teenager or maybe in college, my concept of growth was not having a better understanding of God's will. It was only had to do with being a better person. Like this concept that every bit of growth I was going to do after I left Prattmont was not that I was going to learn more and I was going to understand more. No, it was just that I was going to be better at performing it. That my morality would grow. That my performance would grow. My practices would grow. I don't really consider here that my understanding would also grow and my knowledge of what Christ wants me to do would grow. And I think that's where in lied the problem is that I had thought foolishly that I already understood everything there was to understand here. I had been taught it. I knew what I was supposed to do. That wasn't a priority. Now the only the priority was just performing what I was supposed to do. And then, you know, 10 years go by, and I start reading my Bible. And then all of a sudden, one day, I decide to change a position that I used to hold from as a teenager. And that was hard to do. But what I had to tell myself is, is, hey, I've studied the Scriptures. I've continued to read it. I have an open, fair mind about this. And I'm convicted now that this is what I need to hold for that particular position. I had to make a change because I had to be a changeable human learning from an unchangeable God. Does that make sense again? Your head nods have been very beneficial this evening. Let me go and show you some flags. Let's look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James gives us a great bit of information about what growth looks like. And here we're going to walk towards looking at the perfect law of liberty, looking at that mirror, that analogy we all know. But before we get there, he talks about our attitude towards God's word. And that starts in verse 18. It says, of his own will, 
he brought us forth from the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Looking here as kind of the opposites of James, I think what I can do is pull out some red flags that would show me when I'm stuck. When I'm in a situation where I have stopped growing, I have stopped making changes to better look like the unchangeable God, but instead I've become kind of stuck and stubborn and I'm not growing anymore. My first red flag that I got out of this is, have I ever gotten to the point where I explain my scriptural positions with no passages, but with memories of what I've been taught? That I would try to go up to somebody and try to convince them of my position about our topic, but I don't come with this. I don't come with this. I come with just some memories of what I have been taught in the past, and that's what I try to use to validate my position. I think right there, that should be a red flag that I'm stuck. Does that person here look at the law of liberty? Are they looking in the mirror? Are they continuing in it? No, they're not even looking at the mirror in the first place. They don't know what's in the mirror. That could be a sign that I'm stuck. Also, to go along with that, maybe I'm not prepared to convince, but instead I force my position because simply it's always been that way where I don't even take into consideration to put in the effort to be able to come to somebody and say, hey, look, because I look at this passage and because I look at this passage, I have come to this conclusion, and that's why I want to try to convince you of that. But instead, the only authority I appeal to is that it's always been this way. Have y'all heard that before? You know, hey, I hold this position because that's what I've always held. That could be in a dangerous place, right? Can you put yourself in the moment? in the shoes of the Jewish people when Jesus came to earth? Would they be able to obey the gospel if they held this concept or this attitude? If the Jews that Jesus was present with, if they just decided, hey, look, I'm not going to be able uh, to listen to any kind of convincing. I'm just going to do things because they've always been this way. Would any of those Jews obey the gospel? No, they wouldn't. Because Jesus would bring in something new. And it was convincing, it was persuasive, but if they weren't willing to listen to it, they never would have joined the gospel. In that case, they would have been lost. Here's another red flag. I am unwilling to listen. I only desire to speak. It's funny me saying that in a sermon (laughs) when y'all are supposed to be quiet, listen, right? But that's the concept here that I'm stuck. I'm not willing to listen to anyone. I I just want to speak to somebody. Verse 19, I think sometimes we've used to talk about how we treat other brethren. But in the context here, verse 18, of his own will, God's will, also in verse 21, receive the implanted word with meekness. What context is this in? Verse 19 is under the context of the word of God, how we treat the word of God, that when God speaks to me through his word, I would be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath where I would be more interested in hearing God's word than I would be in speaking my position. Can you think about something Jesus said about being unwilling to listen? Do you remember what he told about the Pharisees? He says, you have ears, but you do not hear, right? What was the thought? The thought was that these people had the ability to listen to Jesus, but they just didn't want to because they were so consumed with their own position that they weren't willing to listen to another one, even if it was coming from the prophet. I am not even willing to examine a new position. Have you ever been in a situation where someone said, hey, I would really like to sit down with you and I'd like to explain to you why I hold this position on this certain topic and you weren't even willing to do that? 
You know what I think that says to me when I've done that? I think that simply has said that I lack the confidence with my position that it will hold up to another one. If I really believe that my position is true, don't you think it would be able to withstand another position that comes from Scripture? That, you know, go ahead, test my position. I think my position will hold up. Does that person think that way? That person's like, no, I I don't even want to examine it. I I don't want to sit down and talk about it. Because, frankly, I think they lack the confidence that their position would hold up to another one. They'd rather protect their position than protect their loyalty to the Lord. And, And one more here. Maybe a red flag would be, I become aggressive to other positions, even when Scripture is being read. He says here, after saying slow to hear, slow to speak, he says slow to wrath. Because the wrath of man will not bring about the righteousness of God. Sometimes I have to tell myself, just because this other brother is trying to teach a different position than mine, before I'm able to get to walk in, I get to try to examine it and study it for myself. Anger is not going to help me. No matter how mad I get, that that brother is teaching those things or explaining those things, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. My anger is no help to me. But what's going to be help is a loving, kind spirit that can sit down and talk about God's word. And that wrathful man, he doesn't fit in there. I think these are some red flags that at least can get you to understand the, the situation we can be in when we become stuck in our growth. Now, what about markers for growth? Where I can see that these are good flags, that I am growing. Look at James 3.13 now. This is James now talking about the wisdom from above compared to the wisdom of the earth. Verse 13, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done with the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, Do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. From where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. But the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Looking at those things and now pulling out some markers for growth. What if I hold a position about a certain biblical topic and I can explain my position with the scriptures? Where I can walk into a conversation and I can say, I have this position and the reason why I have, I, I have this position is because of this passage right here. Would that be a marker of growth? Wouldn't that say that I have studied something, right? Not only that, but wait a second, another step further about growth. What if I can even answer common passages that are used against my position? Where I have an understanding as well because I've talked to people that, okay, I know that you're going to go to that passage. Let's go to that passage now. And let me explain to you why I see the context there and why I think that that passage actually enforces my thought on this passage. Is that not somebody who studied? Is that not somebody who's growing when they actually can come to you with passages? Y'all, sometimes I would say things in sermons that weren't necessarily wrong, but I would use the wrong passage to make that point. Y'all remember he used to walk up to me like this? It was Benny Williams. And I would say something, and maybe I would use a passage in the wrong way, and I'd be standing in the floor, and he was always private about it. He was always quiet about it, but I'd always see him walking up to me like this. You know, with his long old legs. And Benny go, Andrew, I think you need to look at this passage again. And he would read me the passage. And he would explain to me the passage. Say, Andrew, I think you should also look at this passage. Is that not someone who understands? (laughs) Is that not someone who's obviously had some growth? Someone who can actually use scriptures to explain their thought. That is real biblical growth, isn't it? The sad is the other thing. When, when someone tries to come up to you and talk to you about their position, and they're like having to Google passages on their phone, you know, as they're talking to you. Well, obviously that person needs to wait, and they need to go prepare. 
and they need to you know, Google those things at home and maybe write them down and read them over and that sort of thing. I think good growth is sometimes when I go, hey, I do have scriptures for this position. Uh, also, I think a symbol of growth is I'm willing to hear another position when they explain it with scripture. You know, and of course, when someone comes up to me and they have some new position against mine and they don't have any scripture to quote or any scripture to explain it to, okay, yeah, I'm going to throw that away like any other trash, right? But when someone's coming and they say, hey, I have these passages that hold a different position, I believe, well, that's someone I, I should listen to. Give them an opportunity to explain that position because I am confident that my position can hold up to humble hearts if it's good. Then, okay, you know, I have this position, but I want to have a good position. And I want to have that good position that will hold up to humble hearts if it's good. And to go along with that thought, I want my brethren to examine and scripturally critique it. That I have enough confidence that I can take this position and say, hey, I want you to look at it. I want you to examine it, and you tell me what you think. You can stay in James, because we'll go there in just a moment. But in Acts 17, this is exactly what the Bereans did. Acts 17 is a comparison between the Bereans and the Thessalonians. Early in Acts 17, Paul goes to Thessalonica, and he reasons in the synagogue for three weeks. But when he reasons in the synagogue for three weeks, it says that only a few of the Jews in Thessalonica believed. Verse 4 says, and some of them were persuaded. But then you get to Berea in verse 11. It says, these were more far-minded, fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Not some of them believed back in verse 4. Many of them believed. Why? Because they were willing to put in the scriptural effort. Paul had come to that synagogue with some new information. Some new information that the Christ had to suffer. Well, the people that believed it were the people that were willing to take that position and go to the scriptures and see if it's true or not. And because these people put in the effort, they believed Paul. Because they had it for themselves. They did the research on their own. And now they were truly convicted of the position that Paul brought before them. And that's why they ended up obeying the gospel. Shouldn't we be the same way? That, hey, you know, this is a new position. Let's scripturally critique it. Let's search the scriptures daily, and then we'll know for sure of what we should believe. Uh, another one here. A marker for growth would be saying, I am loyal to Jesus and his gospel. I'm not necessarily loyal to my understanding of a particular position. Where do my loyalties really lie? Do they lie here at the scriptures? Or does my loyalty lie to something else where I think I learned the scriptures? If you're still back in James, James gives a great explanation to this in verse 7. He says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. I'm reading chapter 4, by the way. 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy turned to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. A humble, submissive heart to God is someone whom God can work with. A humble heart, a heart that can submit to God, is someone whom God can change. Now, a prideful heart that's stuck, God can't work with that heart. The only thing he's going to do is he's going to forcibly try to humble that heart so he can work with that heart. This is somebody here, the submission to God is a changeable human learning from an unchangeable God. That's somebody whom God's really going to mold. And every day and every year, they're going to change their views and understandings based off what they've learned from the word of God that year, that day. That's someone who's truly growing in their understanding of what God wants us to be. And that's the people that we need to be, and I think that's the people we are. Now, having said all that, I think there's some other factors that come into play that prevent my growth sometimes. And that's the situation where I have an understanding of a passage, and I learned that from a child. Someone comes to me, and they give me a different understanding of that passage, and their understanding is better, and it makes more sense, and it fits with other passages. 
And now I'm having to make a decision whether I'm going to go with this better understanding of the Scriptures or I'm going to have to stay with my less understanding of the Scriptures. And I think there's some other factors that play in that I think we need to acknowledge. One is, and this is something I've been concerned about before, I'm worried about condemning my old teacher. Where a lot of us had men and women that sat us down and explained to us things and showed us things in the Bible, and we have all the love and admiration for them. And we should. And they explained to us a particular position on a particular topic. And now that we have grown in our faith and understanding, now we are being compelled to leave their position and move to a different one because we have a different understanding. And some, I think, maybe will refuse to move on to that understanding or be slow to because they're worried about condemning their old teacher because they're the one who taught them. Well, just to set the record straight, God rewards diligent seekers. He doesn't reward people with perfect positions. Y'all remember what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And this one, especially not the kingdom of God, but we're focused on seek ye first his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Not only that, but Hebrews 11, talking about Enoch. He says, but with faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Who does God reward? God rewards diligent seekers. He rewards people like those Bereans that are willing to put in an effort to figure out what the perfect will of God is. Does he reward people just because they got all the answers right? You know, do y'all think Judgment Day is going to be a list of different, like, scriptural positions? Okay, which, which, uh, where did you fall in line on this particular topic? You know, do you think Judgment Day is going to say, okay, I heard you heard that sermon about Andrew did about Hebrews 10.26. Can you go ahead and tell me right now what Hebrews 10.26 means to you? You got it wrong. Is that our Lord? No, our Lord's the one who promises that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If my old teacher had a wrong position on a particular topic, I'm not condemning them by moving to a different one that I have a better understanding of. I know that God's going to reward that teacher for being a diligent seeker. I'm going to be thankful that that teacher gave me the head start that I needed. I'm not going to think I'm going to condemn them because they might be wrong on one particular position. I'll tell you right now, I guess it only applies to some of you young people. 50 years from now, as you grow in your understanding of the scriptures and you begin to understand a different position that, than I have taught up here, and you even look at it and go, well, I remember Andrew talking about that, but I think Andrew might have been wrong about that. I really think that the position I need to hold is this. 50 years from now, guys, don't worry about me. You go on and you understand the position that the scriptures told you. Y'all, I'll be in paradise. I won't care. And I can say that confidently because Hebrews 11 says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And as long as I'm diligently seeking him, then I'm going to be rewarded. So yeah, leave me in the dirt and go follow Jesus. And that's a good thing to do. Another reason I think sometimes a factor that we allow to control our growth when it shouldn't is I'm worried about losing my credibility. Where now I'm going to have to go up because I've heard this new position and I'm convicted of this new position. Now I'm going to have to go up and tell people that I've talked to about it before and say, hey, you know what? I do not hold that position anymore. I now hold this position because of this passage and this passage and this passage. And we're worried that I'm going to lose my credibility. They're not going to trust me anymore. They're going to think I'm a bad Christian now because I've changed my mind. Y'all, what can be further from the truth? How much respect do I have for brothers and sisters that can say, hey, man, I'm sorry I was wrong about that, but now I see it like this. Because what I'm, all I'm seeing there is not a marker of rebellion or arrogance. I'm seeing right there a marker for growth hey, I used to be wrong about that, but now I hold this position because of this particular passage. Let me show it to you. I have all the more respect for people like this. I'm not trying to get us fired here. Y'all know how many times me and Jason walk into each other's office and say, hey, I've changed my mind about this? If that bothers you, you probably should fire us. <laughs> we say that to each other a lot. 
hey, I was reading this passage, and you know what? I've changed my mind about this particular thing because I've read this passage that I haven't seen before or I've not considered in this context. I think all that is is growth. I hope I never stop saying things like that. And that's what I would like for it to be. I think that's what it is. If I'm worried about losing my credibility and that's what's holding me back from going to something I'm obviously convicted of, well, I would need to be more worried about losing my salvation in that moment. Because when you're convicted of something to be God's word and you purposely choose not to obey it because of some old other belief, you're in rebellion against God in that moment. Does that make sense? When you are convicted of something because of the scriptures, and you choose not to do it, what are you doing? You are rebelling against God. And that puts you on grounds for removal of the fellowship. Because we all know what rebellion is. Hebrews 3 warns it's like this. He says, For we become partakers of Christ if we hold to the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Talking about the rebellion that happened in the wilderness. What happened to them when they rebelled in the wilderness? They dropped dead in the wilderness. Don't be a rebel. Be someone who's willing to make changes to learn from an unchangeable God. That's not a rebel. That's someone who's a follower of the Lord Jesus. Don't rebel against something for some other silly reason. No, follow Jesus and hold to your convictions of what you read of the scriptures and what you've learned from others when they've showed you the scriptures. Let me wrap this up in one little nice little bow. And I think that bow is in 1 John 3. 1 John 3, 2 says this, Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when we, he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. I want to work through this passage backwards. Look at the very end. Everyone who has this hope that they're going to be resurrected and they're going to be able to spend eternity with God, they have this hope so they purify themselves because God is pure. Well, what is that? that? All that is is what I've been saying all night. That's a purifying human learning from a pure God, right? I've been saying an un... Uh, a changeable human learning from an unchangeable God. That's the same thing right there. What is this right here? Or here, purifies. That's present tense, right? This is someone actively purifying themselves. Why are they actively purifying themselves? Because they're learning from a pure God. Is God actively purifying himself? No, he's not. If anyone's stuck and he can be stuck, is God because he's unchangeable and immovable. He is as pure as you can get. Is Andrew as pure as he can get? No, Andrew has to purify himself because I have a hope that one day I will get to be like a pure God. Now, going backwards and going down to verse two, when will I get to stop purifying myself to look more like the pure God? What is the moment when I will get to stop making changes about myself I'll get to when I see him for who he truly is. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Can I suggest to you that one of the rewards of being with God or being like God is we will get to be pure like he is pure. We will get to then, at that moment, finally, be unchangeable like he is unchangeable. What's sad is when I become unchangeable on this earth. Because I'm stuck. I'm not moving anywhere. It's almost like I'm trying to force the reward before I receive the reward. No, instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to be changeable to God's word on this earth so that one day I may be rewarded with the opportunity to be unchangeable before an unchangeable God. And that's a reward that's certainly worth working forward, looking forward to having hope in. Thank you for your close attention.
We're allowed to make changes as we go. Let's not pretend like we're not. We're allowed to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Let's not pretend like we're not. If there's anyone here that like the assistance of the congregation, why don't we come forward as we stand and sing? To linger, charm by girls delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler. These have allured my 